specifically today, uh, reading verse number four, it says having the fellowship, fellowship there, there or, or it says take upon us the fellowship of the ministering uh, to the saints, or uh, yeah, to the saints. So what we're talking about this week is actually we're uh, in number 10 of the series, and so specifically we're talking about this morning missions and giving, what we believe about missions and giving. Now I'll say right out the gate, I put together this sermon more with the intent of teaching it or going through what the Bible says rather than uh, laboring on it and, and preaching on your giving or your support. Now, you know, however the uh, chips may fall, let them, let them fall. Um, surely the Word of God, when it's preached, it pricks our heart. But honestly, my intention is just to see what the Bible says about this. And this really, I think, is an important fact uh, to go through, something that we need to lay out, because you'll talk to a lot of people as you go out knocking on doors or inviting folks to church that actually would say that, you know what, nowhere in the Bible uh, or nowhere in the New Testament does it say that we need to pay a tithe, that we shouldn't take our money to church. You've got all the wicked examples out here of men who have just been overcome with the lust of money and the desires for wealth that have really given the work of the church and the collection for the saints a bad rap and a bad name. You've got those who have just abused the givers and still continue to abuse the givers in churches, people with good hearts who love the Lord and are just abused by greedy men who want to just take and consume upon themselves the gifts that, that others want to give to the Lord. So there's plenty of ammunition out there to say that, you know what, I can stay home. I don't need to go to church to be saved. I don't need to give my money to some organization. But there's two things in the Bible that the Lord speaks of quite a lot, and that is the mission of God's people in the church and supporting them, giving to them. So outlining just a few things here, the first thing that I want to see right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is just a few verses. First of all, I want to see that people have a heart to give. And it's not just rich people that have a heart to give. In fact, I would say what we'd find a lot through the scriptures is actually the people, they give of what they have and they can't give it if they don't have it. But a cheerful giver, one who wants to give to the work and the heart of the Lord, don't we always want to give more than we really can? I mean, we, we give to the point sometimes where we even cut ourselves short because we want to give so much. And so what you find is actually those that become poor, as the Bible says, making others rich. And this, as we'll see in just a minute, isn't just lining the pockets of somebody else. That's, that's wicked. But it talks about just giving, giving our, of our, uh, you know, giving selflessly, giving from our heart, purposing in our heart. All these types of things are what we find in the New Testament, which is an instruction to givers. We see in verse 3 specifically, it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. So we give willingly. Um, in this church, we don't need anybody giving grudgingly. I don't think in Christianity we need anybody giving grudgingly, and I don't think God needs anybody giving grudgingly. Okay, so we, you know, we're going to calculate our, our you know, 10%, and we're going to give it against our will, and we've got other things that we'd rather spend the money on, and we've got a better places that that could go, and don't we know that the bill collectors are calling, and, and uh, you know, we've got all these things that we need to focus on, but you know, we're going to write that check, and we're going to give it to church just because God says we need to. Well, well, listen now, if that's our heart, if that's our motive, then friend, take your money, keep your money, and you know, do with it what you will. God desires a cheerful giver and one who purposes in their heart to give. This, this, is, this is what we find in the Bible. They were willing of themselves. In verse 5 we see it says, And this they did, not as we'd hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us, by the will of God. You know what? When we're talking about giving to the Lord, giving to the saints, giving to the ministers, giving to the church, don't think that we're just talking about getting out your pocketbook and writing a check and going about your way and that's all we need is your money. You know, you hear people say all the time, you can't go to church without hearing about a preach on money. That preacher's always preaching about money. Well, you know what? If they'd come to church more than once or twice a year, then they'd probably see that they preach a whole lot more than just on money. But you know what? We do preach on giving of ourselves. Don't we give of yourselves, give ourselves to each other, give ourselves to the work of the Lord, give ourselves to the house of the Lord. You know, it takes time to do the work of the Lord, whether it's, it's maintaining a, a place where we can come and assemble that's clean and, and well kept and put together. That's not 
um, offensive when everybody comes. Imagine coming into a place and it smells rancid and there's, you know, flies all over the place. I mean, that's not, that's not glorifying. That's not edifying, right? So it takes time to go out knocking on doors. It takes time. Those that travel in a great distance or travel to go soul winning, you know the cost of, of uh, having a car that you're putting miles on, that you have to pay for repairs on, you have to pay for fuel in, all these types of things. It adds up. And so what do we find in the Bible? They give themselves to the Lord first. You know what? When you've given yourself over to the Lord, it's real easy to work for Him, isn't it? You know, you're not, you're not just trying to, you know, do something by obligation, but you've given yourself to the Lord. You've said, Lord, use me. Take me. What do you need? What do you need, Lord? I'm, I'm yours. I'm here. Let's do this. You know, that's the mindset of a New Testament Christian here. So they first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us, Lord willing, it says. You know, we're not out here just trying to be somebody great or do something for what we think that somebody needs or what we can get out of it. It's Lord willing. What does the Lord need us to do? So in the, there's a Christian example here in verse 9. It says, For ye know <clears throat> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became he poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So how is this a Christian example? Well, I would take away from this, again, we don't need to try to devastate our own uh, household so that we can make other people rich in that way of lining pockets. But imagine just the, the, just the selfless uh, attitude that this is, that Christ had, who had it all, who came, who made himself of no report, right? Who was nobody on earth. Why? So that we would have eternal life, so that we would have everything. The Bible says we are rich. We have salvation. It doesn't get any richer than that, friends, Amen. right? Amen. Should, we, should we gain everything in the world and lose our own soul? That, it's proof that eternal life is more valuable than anything. And Christ gave up everything so that we would have it all. But you know what? Just like that mindset of Christ giving up everything, how many Christians today are so restricted in what they do for the Lord because of a selfish motive, a selfish mindset? You know, what's it going to cost me? How's this going to affect me? You know, what, what, is, what am I really, you know, what's the bottom line here? Surely there's fine print here. You know what I mean? Where we've got, it, it's more than just a self-preservation kind of an attitude, it's, it's a selfish attitude is what we find, you know, so many. And you know what? Jesus Christ did not seek wealth. And you say, well, that's obvious. He's God. He didn't, there is no, no earthly wealth that he would uh, strive for. But you know what? There's plenty of people on this earth today that are striving, that are seeking for worldly wealth. And you know what? There's even people in religious circles that are using the name of God to gain earthly wealth. And I'd say that's a, that's a special kind of wicked right there. And they'll have their day standing before the Lord. But the Christian here should have the mindset that, you know what? We should become poor. Now, now who's going to sign up for that? You know, you would have a hard sell going soul winning, telling them that they're going to become poor so that other people are going to become rich. In fact, I would guarantee they'd probably never come to the church if that's what we leave them with. But that is exactly how it is, isn't it? We're not focused on becoming rich. We don't need to gain all these things. I remember in my own life, and I think some of you may have the same testimony, is either getting saved as an adult or, or maybe just getting right with the Lord as an adult, if I can put it that way, kind of growing up, you realize that the things of this world, the things that the, earth, that the world says are so valuable, really have no value at all. You know, now we may still be attracted to certain things, you know, or, or have, you know, certain things that we, you know, like to enjoy. But as far as, you know, seeking value in the things that this world offers, friend, it's just not there. And so when somebody finally realizes that, it's easy to have this kind of an attitude. You know, it's easy to say, you know what, Lord willing, we're going to do this, I'm going to do that. So this is actually a mindset that's contrary to some examples that we find in the Old Testament. If you go back to Haggai, and I love this passage here in Haggai, I just absolutely love it. In Haggai here, this is contrary to these. Now, I'm not making a point here to build the house of God, to build a modern temple. Don't think I'm saying that we need to start selling all of our property and we're going to, you know, add a foyer onto this building and we're, we're getting a steeple and we need some gold ornaments in here. That's not at all what the application that I'm making. That's not what, you know, what we're talking about here. But just notice the people who are actually cursed by God, it says in chapter 2. Okay, they're actually being punished by God. And there's a mindset here. And I, I just absolutely love this. In fact, um, i got to start in verse 3. It says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, 
Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? So what we've got is people that are content. They've worked hard. They've sown seed. They've got their sealed houses, which isn't sealed like with caulk. It's sealed like with a roof. I mean, we've got, we've got a ceiling. We've got climate control here, you know, in the West. So we've got our nice, comfortable houses with everything that we need. Yet the, the house of the Lord was in desolation, dis disrepair, right? It's slack. Now, you know, again, like I said, I'm not trying to promote that we need to have some grand temple here that we're going to start building. But just imagine how many people are sitting back in comfort while the work of the Lord is sitting totally ignored, you know, totally in disrepair. You know, how, how much more soul winning could we get done if we had twice as many soul workers, uh, soul winners, you know? Now, I'm not trying to just, you know, reduce this down to our church. Think about it, you know, nationally. Think about it globally. You know, we, we sit in our sealed houses, we have our distractions, we have our entertainment. Meanwhile, the work of the Lord um, goes, goes cold. But it says, Now we therefore thus saith the Lord, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So think about this for a minute, he's saying. Think about this. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now I tell you what, I know too many people like this. You know the people that just cannot ever get on top? They can't. They can never get on top. No matter what they do, no matter how hard they work, they're always behind. They're always hungry. They're never filled. They're, they're left wanting. Okay? They could win the lottery and they would still be left wanting, you know? This is exactly something that we still see today. <clears throat> what does it say here? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Think about why this is happening, okay? Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, thus saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So what we see here is actually things being withheld by God. Okay, so God is out here just blessing people and pouring out on people. People who aren't paying attention to him, they're not seeking him, you know, they're not considering his ways, they're not thinking about anything other than themselves. And so what, God is just opening up the windows of heaven and pouring you out a blessing so much that you can't even contain it? Well, I find here in the Old Testament that no, actually God was really trying to provoke people to think about what's going on in their life. You know, think about it. Consider your ways. What are you doing, man? He says, okay? <clears throat> to see here in verse 6, it says that he's sown much. You know what? It takes a lot of time to sow much, doesn't it? So this man is busy. He is busy always. But what does he end up with? He ends up with very little. Uh, he's left wanting. And then to keep their wages in a bag with holes, it says there, that's, that's just the illustration that I absolutely love. You know, here in America, uh, everybody is just buried in debt up to our, their eyeballs. You can't get out of debt. And what is it to me? That, to me, that's a great illustration of putting money in a bag with holes in it. You know, you work hard, you gather much, you put it into a bag or into your wallet. You know, a bag would be like with coins. But you know what? By the time you even go a short ways, it's gone. You don't even know where it is. You don't even know what happened to it, you know. And you've got, you got, you know, creditors out here. You've got debt out here. You've got commercialization out here that is just, just chomping at the chance to take what you have, okay. And I'll, I'm not going to get into it right now. We can talk about it another time. But I'll tell you, the, the deck is stacked against us, friend, right. right. The system that we're under right now is stacked against us. So if you even go out here and just try to just live a normal life, I mean, they'll get you. They've got you already, in fact. But <clears throat> the, the deck is stacked against us, okay? But what do we see in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17? We see something here. It says, Since those days, <clears throat> since those days were when one came to an heap of 20 measures, there was but 10. When one came to the press fat for to draw out 50 uh, vessels of the press, there was but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in the labors of your hands, yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. They were cursed 
cursed for not obeying, cursed for not paying attention, cursed for not doing the work of the Lord. And again, I, I'm not trying to make a case here for the temple, but I just want to consider here the hearts. Consider the hearts. You know, somebody would say, well, that's Old Testament. That doesn't even matter anymore. Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law. You know, we, we come together now in a different assembly. You know, we do all these things, but the heart of the people is the matter. And I'll tell you, Jesus Christ was always about the heart of the matter. You know, I've talked about that before, and I'll get into it a little bit here in the sermon. Jesus Christ is always about the heart, okay? So they were cursed. If we go to Philippians chapter 4, <clears throat> we'll get back over to kind of what more maybe would be a little more relevant to us. In Philippians chapter 4, starting in 10, I want to see here an offering well-pleasing to God. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now, at last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, notwithstanding... Ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now, do, does giving and missions go together? Yes, they do. They go hand in hand. And it's funny, too, I love this passage, because what does it say here specifically? It says, fruit to your account. How many missionary letters have you read where they'll always put that on there at the bottom or their signature. They'll sign off with, you know, fruit to your account, so-and-so. We want to have a part in what they're doing. Well, you know what? Support is, is a way that we can do that. You know, giving support, taking care of people, giving for their needs, knowing what's going on with them. You know, to say that it's fruit to your account, it's not wrong to say that. But I'll just tell you right now, there are way too many churches out here banking on the fruit of a few men and not doing anything themselves, okay? They're content with writing a little check or, or having a prayer meeting or, you know, putting out a newsletter and what kind of, you know, fruit are they reaping? You know, what's going on their account? You know, I'll tell you, I think it would be a lot more if they would just do the work themselves, you know. Not to say that we can, you know, should cut off the missionaries, but, you know, that little statement there, I think it's, it's ripped off pretty hard. And so there's a lot of churches that are kind of riding the coattails of a few good men, uh, which is not pleasing to God. <clears throat> but what do we see here? We see missions. We see um, a, a work that is taking place here. We see the needs of a man that's being taken care of here by believers, by followers, by church members, okay? What do we see? We see them, uh, he is here praising the church for the care that they give him. You know, that's a fantastic thing, you know, to say, you know what, I was in need. Uh, I was in affliction and you provided for me, okay? He, he's showing here also how rare it is to find such a generous church. And I think that's even the case today. I'll, I'll bet that is the case today. I mean, how many, you know, churches have abundance to actually give to missionaries or give to uh, workers of the Lord. How many churches today can even pay their own pastors? Very few. I mean, bivocational pastors are the norm in America, okay? So <clears throat> what do we see here? We see how rare it is to find such a generous church, a church that gave to their own poverty, in a sense, that gave more than what they had, you know, miraculously, in fact, is what they gave. What is what they gave. Verse 17 there, it says, fruit to our account. That profits God's man. That does. That, that's, that's fruit that's, that's being done. Now, you've got to be very careful. And I was talking to pastor about this, how um, social media has kind of enlightened foreign missions to a lot of Americans, a lot of people that are here um, on the ground, seeing just what's going on in the foreign lands with, with the money that they're sending, you know, you've really got to consider, is what you're donating to, is what you're giving to, is it producing fruit? I mean, is it even doing anything? 
Or is it just out there letting a guy or a family be on vacation for a few years, send out a newsletter every other month, and then, you know, come on furlough every now and again and come through and talk about, you know, one or two things, okay? Consider the fruit. And now I'm just going to add on to this because this isn't a point in the sermon. Just know that when you give to the church or you give to missions, you're giving to God, okay? If you look at it like you're giving to a man, there again, that's the wrong attitude, okay? And you shouldn't go to the church and say, you know what, I want all those tithes back because uh, you have you've changed something or I, you said something that I don't agree with and so now you need to give me all my tithes back that I paid even if the man stands from the pulpit and says that he would do that for you, he won't. But <clears throat> that's not the right attitude because you give to the Lord. It's pleasing to the Lord that we are givers, okay? So we do give, but still consider. I mean, we're talking about fruit to our account. If you're supporting people that aren't even doing anything with the money that you're giving them, you really have no fruit. There's nothing on your account. So be very careful with that churches, right? So, and then we find that in verse 18, it is a a gift acceptable to God. It's well pleasing to God. Now, isn't that contrary to what we saw back there in Haggai? Okay. The ones that were, uh, that were displeasing God, if I can put it that way, what do we find here? We find ones that were pleasing God. Okay. So pick what side you want to be on. I know which side I want to be on. So what does this actually look like for us? And this is the the question that I'm going to refer back to a couple of times through the sermon. What does this actually look like for us? Now, some would say in talking about missions, giving, tithing, they like to bring up that, uh, that you have robbed God if you don't pay your tithe to your church, right? You have robbed God. Some say, that tithing is unbiblical for the New Testament church. And I tell you, I mean, you just start Google searching or, or AI searching, you know, tithing in church or should I tithe or what is a tithe? You're going to get the full spectrum. I mean, you, you do even a, just a surface level search and you're going to get inundated with these types of, uh, of questions and petitions, okay? So some say that tithing is totally unbiblical for the New Testament church. Uh, and by the way, those that usually say that tithing is totally unbiblical are also the ones that are trying to justify not going to church at all, okay? So they just want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, okay? Some say, sow a seed in faith on your credit card and God will bless you based on your faith. Have you heard these, these uh, charismatic uh, preachers that just go over the top, man? And I tell you, I, I'm telling you, I literally heard them say, get out your credit cards, Get out your credit card. Yeah, you're paying 30% interest, but you know what? The blessing that God's got for you by sowing that seed on that credit card far exceeds, you know, the debt that you're digging yourself into. I mean, just disgusting. But this is what we find out here. This is what we find. How about foreign missionaries? Now, you know what? Again, I'm not down on foreign missionaries, okay? I think that it is very admirable. Somebody that has a heart to go to another country, to, to speak to somebody who does not speak their language or learn another language to go preach the gospel to other people. Very admirable. I love that. I am personal friends with missionaries. I know some in here have family members that are missionaries in foreign lands. I have supported missionaries personally, uh, you know, through their hosting church. I have given personally to missionaries, so I am not totally down on, on missionaries here, okay? But how many... Uh, foreign missionaries, which we know count on the support of the local congregations, okay? So there's missionaries out here that are counting on, on churches supporting them, sending them back. But what do we find? We find that, and they'll tell you, that 80% of the offerings stay within the local ministry, right? So you give to missions, you give to your church. Well, you know what? It's a, it, it looks good that, you know, your church has a big wall with all these missionaries on the back of it, you know, that they're all giving a little bit of money to. But, you know, make no mistake, 80% of the offerings stay within the local ministry. And I'm not saying that it should be more, should be less. I mean, that's just a, that's just a statistic. It's just what it is. So 80% stays within the local ministry. And you know what they'll say a lot of times? They'll say, well, you give 15% to a waitress and you can't give 10% to God. You know, so they'll kind of try to use these figures to kind of browbeat Christians into giving. Well, there again, you know what? It's fine to inform people, to show people. I like missionary presentations where they're showing the land that they're, that they're reaching. They're showing the kids that are there or the activities they're engaged in. I like seeing those things. And, I, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I haven't even been emotionally stirred to really want to support somebody or even supported somebody because of that, right? But nobody needs to stand in front of a congregation and browbeat them to give more right? That, whether, it's, whether it's with, uh, you know, lying about the blessings of God or lying about the cursings of God, the heart, the heart is what matters. So be informed, 
But you know what? This is what we find out here. The broad spectrum. Those that say give everything, going into crippling debt. Those that say give nothing ever for anything. It's all out there. So let's just define a couple of things here, okay? First of all, I want to know what are missions, right? We're talking about what do we believe about missions and giving, okay? So what, what are missions? Looking at missions, <clears throat> the definition simply is just an important assignment carried out for political, religious, or commercial purposes, typically involving travel, okay? That's pretty self-explanatory. Somebody that's on a mission, they're going for business, for religious purposes, and there's usually travel involved, right? Or it can be also, let's not overlook, the vocation or calling of a religious organization, especially Christian, to go into the world and spread its faith. What's the name of this gathering right here? Kansas City Mission. We have a mission to go and to reach people. So that's very appropriate. This, we're not a stranger to this idea here. Okay. Or also, thirdly, a strongly felt aim, ambition, or a calling. So somebody might say, you know what? It was his life's mission to drive a, a garbage truck. It was his life's mission to be the president of the United States. You know, everything that he ever worked for came to that culmination, okay? So you could say that that was his life's mission. But it is doing the work, isn't it? That's, that's what a mission is. A mission is having work to do. A missionary is the one that goes and does it. Biblically, we see the command to give the gospel to the world, and we don't discount the church as part and the support of the Christians. And we've already seen this with Paul's supporters from the churches. It was the churches that supported Paul. It was this, it's the churches that support the work. It's the churches that are behind the work. It's the churches that are training and equipping the workers, oftentimes. Now, they need no man teach them, except they have the Holy Spirit in them. So, you know, it's not like we're ignorant without the church. It's not like we're hopeless without the church. But just look around. Who's doing the work? How many people were even saved because of somebody who was a church member? Now, I'm not saying it was maybe the pastor of a church that got you saved, but through, through uh, outreach efforts of churches, through training, equipping men and ladies through churches, through accountability that's in churches to get people reading their Bibles, to get people to memorize the scriptures, right? Whether it's the fellowship of the churches that emboldens people to be able to go out and to preach the gospel, not only to their friends and family, but also to strangers. It's all church-centric, isn't it? I mean... Very much it is. What do we find in Matthew 28, 18, and 20? Obviously, we find the Great Commission. You can go ahead and turn there. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 18 through 20. says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen, it says here. So what do we have? This is a great commission, and something very interesting is said here. If you'll notice in 17, he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. In heaven and earth. Now, it's often excluded from the Great Commission, and some people just read it without even understanding what it's actually saying. I just want to expound on this just briefly. But what do we find here is actually a commission. Okay? Now, what do we know about a commission? A commission is instruction, a commission is authority to perform said duties, and authority to act on another's behalf. Okay, so when he says all power is given unto me and then gives the commandment, gives the, we're commissioned here to go and to do this work, we have not only the instruction, but we have the authority to perform said duties. Okay, people want to say, well, you know, is it the church that needs to baptize or can anybody baptize? Well, you know what, there's an authority given here by Jesus Christ who has all power given under heaven and earth and he's bestowed that upon those that have the commission, that have received the commission to go and to do the work. So they have the authority, they have the instruction, and they're acting on another's behalf. That's why it says, I'll tell you right there, it just says, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Okay, yes, Jesus Christ is with us always. The Holy Spirit fills the believers. But we're not out here on some rogue mission all by ourselves. We're on a commission out here with instruction, with authority, and acting on another's behalf. We're not out here in our own power doing these things. And friends, when we're growing this church and coming together as this assembly and doing all the work that we need to do, 
And believe me, we're starting to do work, okay? I've been talking to some men about the work that we need to do with this work here. You know, we're not doing this for ourselves. We're not doing this for us. We're doing these things in the authority of Jesus Christ to do the work of the Lord. That's what we're doing. And you know what, friend? When you go out soul winning, when you go out knocking on doors, that's fulfilling the Great Commission. You're out there preaching the gospel. You're out there with Jesus' instruction, with Jesus' authority, with Jesus right there with you, friend, telling people how to be saved. In Mark 16, 15, it says the same thing there. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. John 20, 21 says, Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. We know these things. So who is the missionary here? Best I can gather Pretty much everybody's the missionary. Have you seen that? I mean, are we kind of, that's, what, that's what's laid out here. Everybody's a missionary. I mean, some of you guys drive two hours to come to church. That's like traveling, you know, a, to a foreign land almost, isn't it? I know sometimes I go to these small town soul winning events and it's like a foreign land. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how about in Romans chapter 10? We know 13 so well. In Romans chapter 10, starting in 13, <clears throat> We'll read on from there. I love this passage as well. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God for that. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know what? How shall they hear except pastors are sent? Preachers are sent. Let's say preachers, right? We're all preachers out there preaching the gospel. We're all preachers. And how shall they hear except they be sent? Now, it does not mean that you have to be a member of an independent fundamental Baptist church in America to have the commission to go out and do that. You have to be saved. That's what it is. Saved people are sent to go preach the gospel, okay? So we go out there and we do it. But you know what? I can't help but just think about, maybe it's even just in my life, how instrumental the local church has been through my salvation, through my discipleship, through my trusting the Lord, the local church has been there, the examples that I've been able to look upon, the examples that other men have been for me, okay, all these types of things. How can you overlook the local New Testament church? So what is missions? Missions is doing the work. It's not a business model or a PowerPoint presentation. Even in our church, there are, there's expenditures for going out and reaching the lost. Now, we, in, in this gathering right here, just in our group, we do not take up a missions offering or we do not support a missionary. Iola Baptist Temple does support missionaries. Not at all, saying that they should or shouldn't. That's not even an issue, okay? But this church here collectively, this gathering in Kansas City, we have not decided to support a missionary, or a work. But we do have people give directly to the work of reaching souls. And I will tell you that one of the great ways that people give to the work of, of uh, missions is the small town soul winning events. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever bought lunch for 40 people, but it's pretty expensive, okay? I don't know if anybody's ever bought thousands of cards to leave on people's doors, but it gets pretty expensive, okay? And then all the other needs that go along with that, uh, there are other needs. So people give to the work for missions. We, we, we spend money on missions in this church. Now, what is our mission? Our miss mission simply is reaching the lost, all right? Starting Kansas City, but I mean, it's evident to all of us that this is a much bigger plan than reaching Kansas City, isn't it? I mean, that's our, our mission is, is Kansas City mission, but we've already started working outside of our map with small town, small town trips. I mean, you guys have gone out of state on small town trips. How does that work into the Kansas City mission? Well, it's because it's a bigger mission than what, than what we are looking at, right? We're not even so narrow focused that we, that we only see Kansas City. Missions is the deal, and we're all missionaries, and we all give to missions. We all contribute to it. And, and the Lord is doing a great work. So we do have people, you know, giving directly. And I'll say that there are generous givers in this church. You know, over the years there has been, in Iola there has been, and, and are generous givers that give to the work. 
You know, give to the work. Hey, I want to make sure that gets done. You might not ever see them. You may have never even met them, but they're, they, they will support the work of the church. They support uh, pastor. They support the work here. And they give, uh, they give th their time. They give of their monies. They give all these types of things, which is giving to missions, okay? So I'm not totally anti-missionary, but listen to me. A report back of only a few salvations per year is a bit concerning. Does that concern you? If there's a full-time missionary that's out in the land and he's only sending back report of just a couple of salvations a year. <clears throat> and truly, I mean, in John 17, if you look in John 17, I kind of get the feeling we're all foreign missionaries. I'm not trying to be irreverent to, you know, people who have given their life to travel to a foreign land by any means, but none of us are of this world. <laughs> we're all just here part-time. In John 17, starting in 11, it says, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So, so what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be one who is in this world, but not of this world. Does anybody remember the bracelets from about 10 years ago that were the NOTW bracelets that everybody had on? Not of this world bracelets and t-shirts and, and things like that. You'd find them at Mardell's and places. <clears throat> A good little reminder, honestly, for teenagers that, you know, to just remember who, who we are in Jesus Christ, okay? <clears throat> he says that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name, and those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and thy word hath, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Friend, we've all been sent. We have all been given a commission. Think of it as a foreign missionary, if you will. A foreign missionary with a sealed house that you can sleep in at night. Okay? You know, we have a mission. We have a job to do. So that is what missions is. Okay? Now, can that, can that look like a full-time foreign missionary that comes through churches and, and take support to go and do the work, it, it can look like that. It can look like that. How about a local evangelist that is supported by local churches doing a full-time work for God? It can look like that, okay? But don't think that because we don't support a missionary or we don't support an evangelist that we're not about missions, okay? The Bible is very clear that we're about missions, okay? We are to be about it. So should we support missions? Absolutely. And you know what? I really would like to just interchange uh, a missionary with a soul winner. All right. Is that appropriate to do? I mean, every missionary ought to be a soul winner and every soul winner is a missionary. So we'll just interchange those. How about supporting the church? I say absolutely we need to support the church. Let's go back to the question at hand. What does this actually look like for us? How does somebody give to God? Do you walk around out here with your money or with your check and you just wave it around until it gets caught up in the whirlwind and then it was not? Because that actually was what would happen. It would just become not. It would just go away, okay? Is that how we give to God? Or is there some better way? Is there some way that we can give that God is pleased with? Well, of course, we've already seen that language in this sermon already, that God was pleased with those that give to his work. And that's exactly what the point is that we're going to make here. God is pleased, and he's pleased with us by giving to the church, giving to the work of the Lord. Back to our main passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. <clears throat> he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. So it is not a command, Paul is saying here, to give. Okay, so do we need to stand up and say that everybody needs to give 10%? In fact, scratch that. 10% is not enough. It needs to be 20% because we're going to keep some for ourselves and we're going to send some to the home church and then we're going to do this with it. We're going to do that with it. No, it says, no, wait a minute here. What we're talking about, giving and supporting, okay, which by the way, this isn't a tithe right here, okay? So giving and supporting, 
should be done. It's not a command, but he charges them to be generous with their giving. Be generous with their almsgiving. And this, again, is speaking to the heart of the believer, right? Be generous with what we have. And I know that this is a church full of generous people. So is there a model to give to the church? You say, man, there's got to be somewhere in the Bible where we find this. I mean, if it's important to God, it would be laid out. We'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We know where 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is. We go here soul winning all the time and talking about the gospel, the gospel that saved us, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the good news, okay? The good news that unites us all, the good news that we stand on, where we have our standing, the good news that we preach to others is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then you go through and you continue to read, and we're not going to read the whole chapter here. It's quite a lengthy chapter, actually. So it defines the gospel, which we believe and where we stand. It defines what it is that we believe and how we're even born again. It goes on and it talks about the glorious eternal life afforded to the saved man. This is all good news. I mean, everything through here is talking about the good news of the believer, the, the man that we are, the things that we have, the blessings that have come upon us. And it wraps up with praising God for the victory that we have in Jesus. If you look at verse 58, 57 and 58, but thanks be to God which giveth us which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is great. Every single person in here ought to be praising Jesus Christ for the victory that he has given us. Amen. Amen. There is no lost man that can say that. The victory is salvation. The victory is Jesus Christ. So we're in a good mood. We're in a good place. The Bible's been good to us. God has been good to us. This is terrific. Therefore, my beloved brethren, he says in 58, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the work of the Lord is what is the, is the charge here. The charge is the work. The charge is stand fast and keep working, okay? Mind your heart, mind your motive, and keep working. Now, why, why are we reading this? Yes, we get this. Well, keep reading here. Read past the, the chapter and verse break. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what do we find here? This is simply a model that we can use, that we can pattern, giving to the church, for the needs of the church, for the needs of the saints, for the needs of the workers to be taken up on a weekly basis. The first day of the week. Hey, you know what? Sunday's a good day for that. We're at church anyway, aren't we? So we can give. So there's a, there's a model for the church. Upon the first day of the week, it says, now you can debate the amount. All right, debate that. Um, what's clear is that it's not a tithe, uh, but it is a prepared offering. It is for the saints. And the neat thing is it says... <clears throat> Is it in verse 2? He says, Let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. As God hath prospered him. Now, there's these many things in the Bible that we find that are a little bit ambiguous. And I believe it's to transcend time and peoples and cultures. I've talked about that before. And this concept of either giving a percentage, giving a tithe, you know, if you use it, tithe is 10, 10%, or just giving as, as each man hath been prospered is so awesome by God. He doesn't say that everybody needs to give $250 a week. He doesn't say that everybody needs to give $6,000 a week. See, that, that wouldn't make any sense. There are so many that fall short, and yet there are some that that's a drop in the bucket, right? It would take no faith at all to give that amount, okay? It would, it would be so, uh, so pointed that nobody, hardly at all, could attain that, could keep that instruction. But he's not giving a law. Now, he did say that we ought to take up on the first day of the week, that we have what we need, that we can give it from there. So, you know what, and, and it's as God prospers you. So, I tell you what, is there anybody that God has prospered? I know God's prospered me. I know God's prospered some of you. Isn't it natural that we can, you know, just want to thank God for what he's done and that we can show God that we are walking in faith, that we're trusting him, that he's going to provide for us tomorrow? You know, we all have struggles. We all have things that, that want to swallow us up and tear us down. We all have that. But God takes care of us. And so we walk in faith. Now, like I just mentioned, a tithe is just a tenth of an annual produce, uh, a tenth of annual produce or your earnings, all right? That's, that's what a tithe is. And you know what? You want to talk about a tithe? Uh, Fundamental Baptist has been preaching for, forever 
on Malachi 3, talking about the tithes in the storehouse, haven't they? I love these passages. But what do they say? That, that, that God is angry because they're robbing God of their tithes and their offerings. Okay, so there's people that want to give their 10% to give their good tithe. Yet, you know, what, what, is, what is that? What is a 10% tithe? What is that in the grand scheme of things? Somebody giving it with a, with a, a grudging heart, with a hard heart, giving their 10% so they're right with God. And what's he say? He says, you, you rob and... You're robbing God, and that, that's been used forever. What do we see here in Acts chapter 4? In Acts chapter 4, if you look here, there's, a, there's a, a testimony here of ones who gave. Acts chapter 4. And 34. And actually, we'll start in 33, just because I love how it talks about here, the witness of the resurrection of the Lord and the great grace that was given to them, okay? So, uh, saved, saved persons who believe in the resurrection, verse 33, And with great power gave he the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought, them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, by the apostles, was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, let me ask, is this what God expects? I mean, does God expect that we're to go in to sell our land and sell our properties? Which, by the way, when I read that, I thought, first of all, wait, a Levite selling his land? The Levites are supposed to be the ones that are taking care of the things of God, okay? So how does that even work? What's this guy even doing here? But he was right with the Lord. But is that what God expects? Does God expect this kind of over-the-top, we're going to sell all that we have, we're going to bring it and lay it right here? This spot right here is right where we need to lay it, okay? Is that, is that what God expects? I like to consider the widow's might. <clears throat> in, uh, well, before we get there, I mean, we ought to just keep reading into chapter 5, amen, because Acts chapter 5, I mean, if we're going to talk about an over-the-top offering, <clears throat> it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought, in, uh, and, uh, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back the part of the price of the land? Whilst it's remained, uh, whilst, whilst it's remained was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart that thou hast, lied, uh, that thou hast not lied to man, but unto God? And Ananias, uh, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these things. So, you know what you got? You got the guys that are actually doing it from their heart, that are actually selling what they have, giving to the Lord, bringing it to the apostles, doing it right, their heart, heart motivation. And then, you know what? There's always the people that are just want to be seen a man. Their heart's not wholly in it. Maybe they were tricked into doing it, or they just don't feel good about it. And I got to tell you, I believe that the reason why more Christians don't win the lottery is because God doesn't want to take them off the face of the earth just yet, right? Because here's, what, here's how this goes. We say, oh God, if you would just, just allow me to win the lottery, I'll give it all to the church. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a lot, just a few million, you know? Imagine what Iola Baptist Temple could do with a few million dollars, right? So God, I'm going to do it. You bless me. and I'm. A... You know what God knows? God knows that you're going to keep a percentage of it for yourself. See, he's the one that gives the commission, but if you had that, you would be taking a part of the commission, right? You'd be taking a cut of it, and you know what God would say? He'd say, all right, you know what, that's it. I'm going to have to make an example out of you in front of everybody. So I'm convinced that's why more Christians don't win the lottery. In fact, the lottery is not a blessing at all. It's a curse if you actually study that out, <clears throat> what happens to the people that, that, uh, that win it. But God is not even looking for this kind of over-the-top giving like this out in front of everybody. In Luke chapter 21... Is where we find the widow's might. Luke chapter 21. It says, And he looked up 
and saw the rich men casting in their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For, the, or for all these have of their abundance cast into the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. So we find here that God is pleased with not giving a fraction of our abundance. He is pleased with giving from the heart, even sacrificially. Even sacrificially. I can tell you of a testimony. I have given sacrificially. God is pleased in that. <clears throat> Who gave more? Right? Was it Ananias? Sapphira? Or was it the widow? You know, <laughs> Ananias probably gave a bunch. I mean, he sold a great piece of property. He probably gave a bunch. But who gave more? Who's the Lord pleased with? Consider the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Is the emphasis uh, of the Sermon on the Mount the sayings of the old time? Or is it the heart of man? Isn't he constantly saying you have heard in, uh, in You've heard of in, in old times, you know, you've heard of them of old times, this, you've heard of that, you've heard that this was the way it was supposed to be, but I say unto you, what does he do? He actually raises the bar, and he would make it harder to keep the law, but he's talking about the heart. It's all about the heart. <clears throat> How many are righteously calculating their 10% to grudgingly give it to God? If you want to consider the tithe teaching which is not wrong, okay? Be thankful that God allows you the 90%. Has anybody ever thought about it that way? Why do you have to give God 10%? Why don't you just realize that it all belongs to God? Everything is His. He allows us to have what we have. We're to be a good steward of it. And the fact that we even get to consider 90% of it being our own is pretty darn gracious, if you ask me, okay? That's a great way to look at, look at the money that you have, isn't it? rather than having to grudgingly shave off 10% to give to God. <clears throat> Be a cheerful giver. Let's make sure that we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I, I want to read the whole chapter here. I, I'm really trying not to run long, but... Second Corinthians chapter 9... Be a cheerful giver. God is pleased with the cheerful giver. Support the saints. Support the work of the church. For as touching of the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. He's saying it's not necessary for me to write to you these things you already know. You're great givers. You support the work. We're all on the same page here. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked many. So this is a church that has a reputation for being great givers, okay? Yet have I sent brethren, lest uh, least our boasting of you should be in vain in, in this behalf, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, uh, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you and to make up before your hand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not of covetousness. So this is a, a, a mindset here to be prepared. It is a common practice to give, to have, to offer, to be willing to part with it, not to keep it for themselves, not to hoard it, not to grow a big bank account or invest in, in something local. This is an offering that should be given. And it's a testimony of this church that they're great givers. And in fact, the preparation is even made so that the boasting is not in vain. You know, nobody's going to look foolish here by, you know, not being prepared or uh, over-promising and under-delivering. Isn't that something that we find in America so much today? Why is it we need so much contract law today? It's because of over-promising and under-delivering. And also everybody's a liar. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purpose purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. I'm going to expound on this just briefly. Never underestimate the power of purposing something in your heart. Okay? If you want something in the world and you purpose it in your heart, you will get it, my friend. You will subconsciously... No, I'm not going into, you know, psychobabble here. But you work for what is purposed in your heart until you get it, friend. 
Okay? So what does it say here? Every man has a purpose in his heart, so let him give. You know, I'm going to purpose in my heart to give to this. I'm going to purpose in my heart to give to this. I'm going to purpose in my heart to help this person or to be a blessing to this person. You know what? It's going to, if I can use this word, manifest. Pastor, pastor preached on that recently, you know, manifesting things and not trying to get weird with it, but bringing to fruition the things that are in our heart. Okay? This biblical. Okay? For God loveth a cheerful giver. You purpose in your heart. It comes to fruition. We're excited about it. Never underestimate the power of that. When somebody says, you know what, I just can't make it to church on time. It's because you didn't purpose it in your heart. I just can't make it to that soul winning uh, ever. I want to. I want to be there. But I purpose it in your heart and you'll be there. Okay? I just can't do this. I can't do that. I, I, you know, I'm always late for work. I'm not even just talking about, about spiritual things here. I'm always late for work. Well, purpose it in your heart to get up in the morning and go to work. And you know what will happen is if you purpose it in your heart the night before, then you'll go to bed at a decent hour so that you can actually get up and go to work the next day. Church is the same way. We're so spoiled here, let me just say it, to be in church at 2.30 in the afternoon. Years of my life was spent getting to church hours before church actually started to run buses in bad weather, cold weather, starting buses. 2.30 in the afternoon, are you kidding me? Anybody can make it to church at 2.30 in the afternoon, okay? But yet, we still need to purpose it in our heart, friend. You need to purpose it in your heart. You, you need to purpose it on your heart. If you're going to go on vacation, purpose it in your heart to go to church on vacation. Look up churches before you go. Don't just hit the road and be like, yeah, we'll, we'll stop along the way. You know what's going to happen? You're not going to church, friend. It, it, the opportunity never presented itself. It's because you didn't purpose it in your heart. All right? As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. He that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread to your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which casting through us, uh, which causeth uh, through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by the many thanksgivings unto God. Uh, this verse, verse 11, talks about thanksgiving to God. How, are we, how, are, how do we show God that we're thankful? You know, do we give him a half-hearted prayer as we're, uh, you know, dozing off at night, you know, thanking him for this or that? Do we speed through a quick prayer at mealtime? Uh, is that how we give our thanksgiving to God? I see right here a couple of thanksgivings unto God that we ought to be mindful of. And what is it connected to? It's connected to sowing seed, giving, supporting the work, supporting the, 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 the saints. Verse 13, while it's by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God on your uh, for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Guys, we ought to be cheerful with all of our giving. Okay, I know a lot of people that will say if a homeless person comes up or a beggar's on the street, they say, you know, I give through my local church. I don't think that's a, a wrong response. You can say that. I do my giving through my local church. You know, it's appropriate. I know some, some people that would never give to a, a beggar or a drunk on the side of the road that's just looking to get another bottle or another hit. Uh, they say, no, I'm not giving my money for that. That's, that's your choice. That's your discretion. But you know what? Christians ought to be charitable people. We ought to be cheerful givers. When we see somebody in need, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in need before, whether it was on the side of the road or whatever the case is. I hope somebody was there that could help you out. And wouldn't it be a shame if the best givers were the ungodly, worldly people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And Christians are known for being stingy and low tippers, actually. Does that hit below the belt? Because I think in restaurants, Christians are pretty much known for being, some are known for being stingy and, and poor tippers. So I'm just saying, we need to be careful about that. We ought to be generous all the time. And it says right there, your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayers for you, which long after you for the exceeding uh, grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gifts. Who, who, who is it that's giving the gift? It's God that's giving the gift. Did you see that there? For his unspeakable gift. It's God that gives the gift. And we've got some other verses that get into that as well. <clears throat> so what do we find here? We find if we go to Malachi 3.10, let's do it. Let's go to Malachi 3.10. Malachi 3.10 What do we find? We, we just talked about multiplying a seed sown. God blessing those that are giving.
Malachi 3, starting in 8, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Yea, ye have robbed me, but say ye, wherein have we robbed God? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall, be, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And, verse 11, this is actually my favorite verse of this whole bit right here, is verse 11. It says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So many today. Not only are they running around with a bag with holes in it, but then they've got that devourer coming back, tearing down everything that they're trying to do. I don't, for time's sake, I'm not going to expound on that. I don't need to expound on that. But listen to me now. Giving with a right heart, you know, d purposing in your heart that you're going to give and being cheerful about giving, looking around and, and being mindful of the needs of the church, of the people, of the ministers out here, the saints that are doing the work, being mindful of those things is pleasing to God. It is pleasing to God. <clears throat> Malachi 3.10, we're talking about sparingly and being held back. Malachi charges the people who have robbed God because they held back tithes and offerings. Today, for sure, people withhold offerings that God would have people to give to support pastors and the expenses of the church. I don't have to explain to you guys all the different expenses that a church has, but there are many. <clears throat> Remember Haggai 1? Uh, they had the bag with the holes in it. Malachi 3 uh, says that God will rebuke the devourer. Which, which do you want? Do you want a bag with holes in it and the devourer on your coattails? I know life feels like that sometimes. At least it has for me. I can't speak for everybody. I know it's felt like that for me. And I know I've seen people and I feel bad for them and I pray for them and I say, good Lord, they can't get on top for anything. Like, it's one step forward and two steps back. Okay? Or what do we find? We find those that God is prospering. God is multiplying their seed sown. <clears throat> Again, not to connect 2 Corinthians to Malachi, because we're not talking about a tithe. We're talking about being a cheerful giver in our heart, which would look more like alms. But notice, rather, the heart, giving out of your liberality to the saints, uh, uh, giving out of your liberality, uh, giving to the saints, giving to the church, and giving to men, as we saw in verse 13, giving as a cheerful giver, giving to God rather than man. I'm going to tell you what, friend, that totals more than 10%. You might not like to hear it, I'm not even going to put a percentage on it because that's between you and God. I heard a testimony. I don't know if it's true or not. Pastor may have heard the same testimony. There was this guy that challenged God years and years ago. He grew to be an old man, and I'm sure he's probably dead if he ever even existed. But he, he told God, he said, God, I'm not going to live off the 90 while you get the 10. I'm going to give you the, the 90, and I'm going to live off the 10. And he ended up being a very wealthy man and gave tons of money to missions and was blessed by God, you know. So I'm not even going to tell you what the percentage is. But... One of a cheerful heart, a cheerful giver, you know what? You're going to give to others before you're going to take for yourself. I'm just going to put that out there. That really is what this looks like. Uh, uh, becoming poor that others may become rich. <clears throat> that was what we saw there uh, for Jesus, for sure. But are we not Christians? <clears throat> God's direction is for the heart. God's direction is for your heart. Okay. So teaching a 10% tithe is appropriate. I hope that you teach your kids how to tithe. I hope that you teach them that giving to the church is important, that it's good. Uh, I love doing that with our kids. They don't get an allowance, but I do uh, make my boy work for his money, and Dahlia works for her money as well around the house and things. And so whenever they get money, uh, we haul scrap to the scrapper or whatever we do to, to earn money. Uh, my kids tithe off of it. I think it's important to teach our kids to do that. This church relies on the giving of the members. Uh, if you're thinking that it will break you, I'm going to share just a few verses with you in Acts 20 and 35. Actually, for time's sake, Acts 20 and 35 talks about being uh, that it is uh, you're more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, so you want blessings? Do you get blessings by giving or receiving? Okay, in Luke 6 and 38, <clears throat> we find here: Are you going to be, are you going to be generous, or are you going to be stingy? Which side do you want to be on? Okay, in God's eyes, in uh, Matthew 6 1 through 4, we can turn there. Matthew 6.
in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, that they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret uh, himself shall reward thee openly. So what we find here is we find those that, uh, that give secretly, and God rewards thee openly. So we want the rewards from God, then we give, and we give secretly. And this is not talking about a tithe. I know people that have uh, not put their name on their tithe envelope. They have not wanted to do these things. They say that you know, they want to be more um, anonymous with that. Hey, that's, that's certainly your, your prerogative. Um, that's your right to do that. I'm not saying that, but that's not what this is talking about here. This is talking about giving our alms and not being seen of men, okay? <clears throat> in Proverbs 19, 17, you don't have to turn there. If you do, keep your place in Matthew. We'll be right back to Matthew chapter 6. But it says that the alms are to the Lord and he will repay thee. So how is it that we, that we give to the Lord? Because it's him that repays us. It's by our alms. It's by giving to others. You can go back and you can read that proverb. It's good. Ni Proverbs 19, 17. Alms are to the Lord and he will repay so the way that we give to the Lord, because I asked that, how do you give to the Lord? Do you go out here and you hold your money up until a whirlwind comes and takes it away until it was not? No, actually, you can give to the Lord by giving to others. All right. <clears throat> and then we're talking about generous giving from our heart. When you don't have abundance, <clears throat> when you don't have the abundance, it's easy to give when we have extra. But you know what? Giving when we have extra can be over the top, but not giving when it's... Uh, not just giving when it's easy for others to see. So what God is pleased with is giving the, to those that don't have it to give all the time, that give sacrificially, you know, that it can be hard to give. Uh, that is actually what over-the-top giving would be, not giving of our abundance in front of everybody that others may see it and we can be somebody. Somebody that's trying to be somebody by giving to church or making sure that other people know who they are, what they give, uh, there's, no, there's no place for that in church. I'll just tell you that, you know, you're not getting a plaque, you're not getting a bench out front, you're not getting your name on the building, all right? You're not going to be thanked from the pulpit profusely, you're not going to be patted on the back uh, to be somebody in front of everybody, okay? So I don't think that's an issue here, but I've just got to say that because you go to some of these churches and boy, they're just walking around, you know? So there's no place for that. In Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we find here where our treasure is, that's our heart. And our treasure is in heaven. Our treasure is not on earth. Okay? If your heart is on the things of the earth, then we need to check and consider uh, where your treasure is. All right? Uh, maybe if you're, if you're working too much to build up a treasure on the earth, you need to cut back on your hours and go do some soul winning so that you can lay up some treasure in heaven. Amen? And then it's going to be contagious. And then you're going to see what heavenly treasure feels like and what it looks like and what it feels like. And you're going to feel the power of the Holy Spirit working through you when you're preaching the gospel to somebody else. And all of a sudden, the things of this earth are going to pass away. They're going to diminish. And you'll see what's real and what's true. And it's uh, uh, fruit in heaven. So in conclusion here, I'm just going to share this one point. I think it's an important point to make as I'm giving this sermon today, talking about this church and uh, the, the forming of this church as we go on forward here. Uh, in conclusion, giving to God is not to make the ministers rich. <clears throat> not in this church, and it shouldn't be in any church. Whether you're speaking of pastors or missionaries or saints or whatever, now, yes, it is true, we read it, that Jesus Christ was made poor so that we may be rich. And friend, I've told you already, we are rich, okay? You and I are rich. Now, locally, how do we apply this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 20, it was part of our main passage. We read it already. It says, <clears throat> avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. So here's what happens is people give to the church and there's a collection that's taken up and it sits on the counter and it, it looks like a lot of money, right? And so it comes together, we tabulate it, we, we count it up, we put it into the treasury, we spend it on the things of the church or the work or the saints or support or whatever, 
Um, the church has decided is an important thing to spend it on. That is what we do. It can look like a lot of money, but here's the fact of the matter is that though it looks like this abundance that we have, which is administered by us, is some great thing, we need to make sure that we show also that it is honest, that it's honest things. And we don't only keep it honest in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of the men. So though we're not preaching on giving per se, uh, as far as this church is concerned, I will tell you that I am not afraid of preaching on giving. I'm not afraid of preaching on money. Um, there are 31,000 verses in the Bible, and 2,300 of them speak of money and things of that sort. So it is a very... Um, solid topic in the Bible. In fact, you can read AI tells me that that's two times more than the verses that talk about faith and prayer combined. Okay, God talks about money in the Bible. So I'm not afraid of these things. God has blessed me by sacrificially giving over the years and faithful giving for many years. And I am a proponent, a proponent, okay? I do believe in having transparent records, uh, business meetings, giving people giving records if they want. If somebody wants to be anonymous or ambiguous and give in cash and not worry about a, a giving statement, great, praise God, not worried at all about that. But for those that would say, you know what, I see all this money coming through here, where's it going? We'll have business meetings, we can talk about these things, totally transparent on those things. And I think it's because the Bible is very clear that this abundance which is administered by us, we're providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men, right? So should there ever be a question or a concern or anything? The church has got to be transparent about that. You know, what do you see in so many of these churches where they've got all these dirty dealings? It's all this secrecy. It's all this hierarchy. It's all this, you know, covering up and all these types of things. That's just ridiculous. So we don't need anything like that. There's no place for that in God's house. So anyway, getting through the series, there's just either one or two uh, sermons left in the series. I'm talking today specifically about missions and giving. It's important for Christians paramount more than anything is to consider our heart and be cheerful givers all right whether it's with the little that god has for you that you can give praise god for that little amount or whether it's with liberality and generosity it's the heart that matters and god blesses a cheerful giver and you know i i'm I, i've got no doubt that god can take care of the needs of this church he'll take care of the needs of the members individually and he'll take care of the needs of the church the expenses of the church uh, much of the prayer that Pastor and I have been uh, doing over the last two years has been, you know, considering this church, the stability of the church, the expenses of churches, I mean, all these types of things. And not this church only or this group here, but even in Iola. But you know what? God is in control of these things. All right? God is the one that is doing all this. God is building the church. Amen. We're not building the church. God is building the church. He's adding to it. So let's pray. God in heaven, we love you so much. Thank you for today. Thank you for this lesson. It's, uh, it's a long lesson, Lord, but I believe that we need to be on the same page about this. And uh, quite honestly, it's, it's a different opinion than what we'll find in the world. We all have friends and family members that will counter these arguments, that will tell us that we're crazy for giving to you or to the work of the Lord. They want to tell us about all the crooked dealings in other churches and other men that have... Uh, defiled the house, uh, your house, but God, I, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for this group of believers. I ask for your blessings upon us in our families. I, I ask for, um, for blessing, financial blessings. I pray for uh, just good health and, and the fact that we can just be focused on the work and stay focused on you and, and walk in obedience uh, in your ways for your honor and your glory. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.